Climate change has been the norm throughout Earth's history, but we're being told that there is something special about the one we're experiencing now. Is there? To answer that question, there's another basic question that we first must address, namely, what causes it? That question boils down really to two issues. The first concerns the energy balance of the Earth. The global temperature of the Earth is the result of an energy balance. Energy comes into the Earth in the form of sunlight, and energy leaves in the form of infrared radiation. Global temperature is the point at which those two come into balance. Both are forms of electromagnetic energy, so the balance point boils down to the Earth's radiation energy balance. The second concerns the responses of living systems, which can include not only organisms, but also ecosystems, to an expected change of global temperature. Neither of these are at all well understood, so it pays to be cautious in our assessments of the supposed problem. It also pays to be cautious about the proposed solutions to the supposed problem. Without a full understanding of the physics and biology, which no one can claim to have, our solutions may be more damaging than the problem itself. Well, okay, what about that energy balance? The Earth's climate is driven by the input of radiation energy from the sun, so-called solar radiation. The sun is a hot globe surrounded by an atmosphere of extremely hot gases known as the corona. The glowing surface of the sun is known as the photosphere, which radiates energy at a color temperature of about 5,780 kelvins. The Earth is worn by radiant energy transmitted from the photosphere through space onto the surface of our planet. Overlaying the surface is an atmosphere consisting of a mixture of gases, mostly nitrogen and oxygen, small amounts of the noble gas argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. What's heating people up over the issue of climate change, so to speak, is the increasing presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the effects it has on the global thermal energy balance. We can judge the effect of solar radiation on energy inputs to the Earth by plotting the so-called spectral irradiance versus the wavelength of light intercepting the Earth. Spectral irradiance is simply a measure of the intensity of energy streaming in on solar radiation. We're going to differentiate between three bands of radiation. At short wavelengths, below 400 nanometers or so, is the ultraviolet range. Above 7 or 800 nanometers, we are in the infrared range. Sandwiched in between the two is the visible range of wavelengths. That is the part of sunlight that we can see. At the top of the atmosphere, where sunlight first intercepts the Earth, we get a curve of irradiance that looks something like this. The shape of this curve should look familiar. It is very close to what we would expect for a black body radiating at a temperature of around 5,250 kelvins. The peak of the spectral irradiance curve is located well within the visible spectrum. Extending off to the right, we see that there is a considerable quantity of energy contained in the infrared range. In fact, most of the energy intercepted by the Earth is not in the visible wavelengths, but in the near-infrared wavelengths. These infrared wavelengths extend to black body temperatures that are still quite high, though, as high as about 1200 kelvins. If we now turn to the radiation that actually reaches the surface of the Earth, namely the sea level irradiance, we see two things. First, sea level irradiance is considerably less than irradiance is at the top of the atmosphere. This is due to the absorption of light energy by the atmosphere as light streams down to the surface. The other thing we notice is that there are several bands in the infrared range where the sea level irradiance drops considerably. These are bands of wavelengths where the atmosphere is relatively opaque to the radiation streaming through them. These bands exist because certain gases in the atmosphere absorb energy at these particular wavelengths.
So, for example, oxygen is relatively opaque at a wavelength of a little over 750 nanometers, which produces a drop in the sea level irradiance at that wavelength. Most of the bands of low sea level irradiance, however, are caused by water vapor in the atmosphere. Note that carbon dioxide is responsible only for a very small dip in surface irradiance at a wavelength of around 2,000 nanometers, well into the infrared. We see right away, therefore, that the sun will warm the earth in at least two ways. At wavelengths where the atmosphere is transparent to sunlight, the sun warms the earth's surface directly. At those wavelengths where the atmosphere is relatively opaque in contrast, the atmosphere absorbs the radiant energy. Now, sunlight does not warm the surface, but warms the atmosphere. So, we see the first complication of the Earth's energy balance. Depending upon the wavelength, solar radiation can either warm the surface, or it can warm the atmosphere. Absorption of a photon converts the energy in that photon into heat. Atmospheric gases that absorb strongly in the visible and infrared bands therefore warm the atmosphere. Water vapor is the most significant player here, and the effects of carbon dioxide here are essentially nil. Gases that are transparent in the visible and infrared bands allow the energy in the photons to reach the surface of the Earth, warming the surface. What I'm describing here is only one part of the Earth's energy balance, the incoming energy. The Earth's radiation balance also includes energy leaving the Earth. The Earth's surface and atmosphere typically are a few hundred kelvins above absolute zero, and so these also emit radiation energy, although at much longer wavelengths than the visible. So let's turn to that other half of the radiation energy budget. Here again is our surface of the Earth, overlain by an atmosphere. The Earth's surface temperature, which can range in temperature anywhere from about 260 to 320 kelvins or so, therefore radiates long-wave infrared radiation to the atmosphere. The upper regions of the atmosphere are quite cool, typically about 250 kelvins. This is still considerably above absolute zero, so the atmosphere emits infrared energy to the Earth's surface. The temperature of deep space is very cold, on the order of 2 to 3 kelvins, which represents the cosmic background radiation that is the remnant of the Big Bang. The Earth's atmosphere, which is considerably warmer than that, will radiate infrared energy into space. 2 kelvins for its part is also higher than absolute zero, and so this will radiate energy back to Earth, although this will be negligible. Earth temperature, in quotes, therefore is a temperature distribution of surface temperature, atmospheric temperature, and deep space temperature. Deep space temperature is fixed, obviously, but surface and atmospheric temperature will depend upon the radiation and energy balance of the Earth's surface and atmosphere. That radiation energy balance is determined by the optical transmittance of light through the atmosphere. Let's look at the clarity of the atmosphere to light of different wavelengths, expressed as transmittance, which is the inverse of opacity. We're covering quite a broad spectrum here. This is because we need to span a quite broad range of black body temperatures, ranging from more than 5,000 kelvins in the visible band down to less than 200 kelvins at extremely long wavelengths. Let's lay out some markers just so we can get our bearings. The visible band is confined to this narrow band of frequencies here to the far left of the spectrum. Meanwhile, the Earth's black body temperature spans a broader range of wavelengths, positioned around the longer wavelengths of the far infrared spectrum. Here's what the optical transmittance of the atmosphere looks like over this broad spectrum. You can see, again, that there are several bands of wavelengths where the atmosphere is relatively opaque, that is, it has small transmittance. Most of these bands of opacity are due to the presence of water vapor in the air. There are several other bands of opacity that are due to the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The first thing to note is that most of these bands of CO2 opacity occur at color temperatures that are not really relevant to our question. 
So, for example, CO2 opacity that is outside the Earth's range of black body temperatures contribute nothing to the Earth's energy balance, and hence have no effect on global temperature. There is only one band of CO2 opacity that fits within the range of the Earth's black body temperatures. You can see here that CO2 has only a small effect on the atmosphere's clarity to infrared radiation at that wavelength. This is an outline of the basic physics of so-called greenhouse warming of the Earth. The Earth is warmed by solar energy streaming into the Earth in the visible and near-infrared spectral bands. The Earth is cooled, on the other hand, by the radiation of energy at far longer wavelengths in the so-called far-infrared spectral bands. The presence of carbon dioxide by introducing a band of relative opacity in the atmosphere at these long wavelengths impedes the loss of heat from the Earth through long-wave infrared radiation. However, as you've seen, the contribution of carbon dioxide within this band is slight. This is not to say that its effect is negligible, but it helps to keep things in some kind of energetic perspective. Much of the concern over increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere points to increases of global temperatures of roughly 2 to 5 degrees Celsius. Thermodynamically, of course, this temperature increase is quite small. An increase of global temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to, say, 27 degrees Celsius is an increase of only 2 degrees. What is important to realize is that it is thermodynamic temperature that is relevant to the radiation heat exchanges. An increase of 2 degrees from 25 to 27 degrees Celsius represents an increase of thermodynamic temperature from 298 kelvins up to 300 kelvins, an increase of only about 0.6%. This is well in keeping with the slight effect of carbon dioxide on radiative cooling in the far infrared band. In fact, when one considers the overall radiation energy balance of the Earth, it's hard to escape the conclusion that it's not carbon dioxide that is an important atmospheric greenhouse gas, but rather water vapor. Variations of water vapor content of the atmosphere affect global climate far more than variations of carbon dioxide content.